I, I am sure you actually will support also in the next six years. So. <laughs> me, me happy, less worried. So we have discussed about monitoring, but we have an example of what happened, for example, in a Scandinavian country. So I asked to, to Lars. Okay. You can show us one, two second example, a long lasting example of monitoring of wildlife and the impact of monitoring and management in Scandinavia. Where do I press the? So thank you for inviting me to talk about things, how, how things are in Scandinavia. My name is Lars Hilström. I'm from the University of Järve in Sweden. Uh, uh, this is Scandinavia. <laughs> Little old map. Uh, here's a new one. Uh, so Scandinavia is, is uh, Sweden, Norway and Denmark. You know the Scandinavian Airlines system. A company, uh, and I will talk then as um, requested by Joaquin about Scandinavian model of wildlife monitoring and management. Um, uh, I will start with like a big picture about monitoring ungulates uh, like moose, roe deer, in relation to hunting moose, and also but its relation to carnivores, like the wolf, lynx, and brown bears. And um, yeah, we'll talk a little bit about the moose population development in Scandinavia over time, because the moose is the most uh, important ungulate in Scandinavia, uh, because uh, roughly we would say that there were have been 300,000 hunters in Sweden, and uh, there have been 300,000 moose before. Now it's like 250,000, but most of the people are interested in hunting moose. And I will also say uh, something about the wolf population and the other population development in Scandinavia over time, and then mention some, yeah, transboundary interactions. So, but first, I, I need to say that the uh, Swedish Environmental Protection Agency is the ones that uh, are doing the uh, the review, uh, the, yeah, promoting research and development of uh, wildlife management in, in Sweden, and they work also together with the other protection agency in Norway and, and Denmark, and also Finland. So yeah, towards a better environment and international cooperation across borders for sustainable future. By exchanging insights and experience with partners all over the world, we, we can break new grounds together with and move forward in common for, for a sustainable society. So this is just directly from the web page. And uh, they really are yeah, empowering partnerships uh, with partners all over the world. Yeah, so I will say something about this big pictures about the moose and its relation to carnivores, forestry, and hunters in, in Sweden. So these are three things that are really inter, um, are connected. So importance of moose, on one hand, we can say that browsing damage from moose is uh, having huge costs, like 50 to 100 million euros per year. And uh, there's a lot of investment in monitoring how much food is there and how many moose are there. And uh, actually, at the local level, there are, it's a very, very difficult of acceptance uh, among the local moose hunters. Uh, and uh, yeah, the moose, the hunters want as many moose as possible, and to increase the amount of moose 
Sweden. But the forestry, on the other hand, they want to keep the moose on a lower level because of the browsing damage on pine plantations made by the moose. But mostly, yeah, the pines. They doesn't seem to go on the on the spruce. And most of this is done during the winter season, uh, more or less between November and April, depending on latitude. And uh, yeah, as I said, the moose is the most attractive animal for hunting. Uh, we can talk about ecosystem services. They have a very important culture and social values. And um, as um, calculated, this is you have very rough, roughly, but the value of the meat and the culture and social values exceeds the cost like like 200 million euros per year. So yeah, the hunters want as many moose as possible and to increase the demand, but um, we have also the big carnivores, the wolf and the brown bears that locally can have a strong effect on the population dynamics of the moose. So here is from some other cameras that we have in the project just to determine the local variation in space and time. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so here's a short story of our population development in Scandinavia during the last 250 years. So in the beginning of the 19th century, there were very low numbers, both moose and roe deer in Sweden. And that was due to governance. We have talked a lot about governance uh, yesterday and today. And there was a new law by the King Gustav III in the late 18th century. So before it was noble that had the right to hunt, but he changed that law. So everybody had the right to go out and hunt. And uh, this led to an almost extinction of the moose in Europe. So in the beginning of the 19th century, the Swedish Hunting Association was formed uh, with the objective to manage the moose and the roeder population. And today, uh, there has been about 300,000 relatively stable, but now they are, it has decreased uh, somewhat. So maybe 250,000 today. So then about management, how is it managed today? Uh, well, there is different methods. So one is what's called Jakt Dobson, hunting observations that they do during the hunting season, mostly performed during one or two weeks in the autumn. But it, with all the observation from all the hunters, it leads to huge sample size. However, there have been critics to this method because they can be double counting by uh, the same moose can be count maybe five times because uh, hunters observe the same moose that is trying to avoid the, the hunters. Uh, pellet counting is probably the, the, the oldest ones performed during spring after snow melt. Uh, sometimes we use helicopters. Uh, it can cover big distance and short time, but moose can also hide under big trees. And it's, yeah, it's very expensive. And nowadays, we talk more about using camera traps more and more, coming in Scandinavia. Actually, there's a new project uh, that uh, by the Swedish Hunting Association to install cameras from the south to north. I just talked to a person last week. So as I understood, they're going to use the same grid system as we use in the AOW project. So. And uh, yeah, about something about the management of the moose. So there is this wildlife management delegation, which is about uh, 10, 15 years old. So at the county administrative board, uh, they have set up this, and it's 13 external members on the leadership of governor make the most of the decision and guidelines for the hunting. And yeah, again, most of the important of this is 
planting of the moon, which is uh, always conflictive and also it's also in relation to the, how many carnivores and then again the wolf, how many wolves can be hunted. Uh, so, um, yeah, the moose is like the central of, of uh, management in, in Sweden. And this, yeah, wild management delegation is, um, they should also represent uh, other interests like uh, hunt, yeah, hunting and game conservation, of course, but also outdoor life, nature conservation, agriculture and forestry. And in addition, five politicians are also in this. Uh, and we have talked about, yeah, other values than just the uh, hunting. And, and that's something that has been discussed more and more in, in Scandinavia. Um, recently, quite recently, road deer has been come up to this discussion, maybe one of the reasons why there's been a decline in moose in Sweden because they can be important competitors so they can eat the same kind of food during uh, yeah, especially during the summer and parts of the autumn and that can actually have importance for the decrease of the moose and in addition to the road we have also explosion of uh, the fallow there uh, there are now about 120,000 fellow there in Sweden that has increased dramatically during recent years. And uh, Joaquin wanted me to, to mention something about the transparent cooperation. So this is a, a Swedish Norwegian project, Grenzevilt. So it's the Swedish University of Agriculture and Norwegian in London that has received funding for the project with the goal of reducing border barriers for Scandinavian game and so they were working with uh, different species, like uh, the wolf, uh, because there are quite a few territories that are between uh, Norway and Sweden. So just a short story of the wolf population in Sweden. So from the 18th century and onwards, there were strong delimitation of the wolf population. And one of the reasons was to be yeah, they killed the livestock. Uh, some figures tell that yeah, they shot like 6,500 wolves per year during some years. So, and uh, there was also, until the 1960s, a person hired just to shoot wolves. So living in the forest and, and just to go out and, and shoot wolves. Uh, Yes, uh, mm, I think yeah, I, I checked just now. Uh, there are about 500, uh, uh, 500 uh, individuals in Norway and Scandinavia, and in Scandinavia, I mean, Norway and Sweden. They have, it. and uh, I think actually, yeah, so there's a little bit error here. So 500 in Sweden, in Sweden and, and Norway together, and about 100 in. Anyway, uh, when comparing to other countries, let's say there are 500 in Scandinavia, it's extremely little compared to Spain, to other countries, even in Latvia, there are 1,000 millions of, uh, of, of wolf. Uh, but in Sweden, uh, it is also an important predator of the, of the moose. So therefore, the, uh, the upper limit is set to a very low level, and uh, this low level actually is very dependent on that we constantly get an inflow from the mother population in Siberia, Finnish Russia. This figure shows the spot of distribution of territorial wolf pairs open circles and packs uh, 
confirmed uh, or unconfirmed from 2005 to 2016. And you can see there on the map that there are quite a few pairs that are on the border between uh, Sweden and Norway. The Wolverine, I should say, Krista Dedos, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a success story in Scandinavia. Uh, this shows uh, the distribution uh, in Scandinavia from 2003 to 2013. And uh, why do I say success? Yeah, they have increased. They used to be only in the mountain region, uh, but they have come down to the boreal region, as we have seen in our wildlife cameras. Uh, so in, in the boreal forest, they are now occurring. So they seems they are spreading uh, from the mountain region uh, down to south uh, east in, in Sweden. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's speculation. Why, why does it happen now? Has it something like delayed effect of the wolf population has now been uh, there for a number of years, because you remember that in 83, there was only three, three wolves left in Sweden. And from then they have increased and of course the wolf leave a lot of food for, for the, the wolverine, which is uh, partly a scavenger. This shows just the figures of the wolverines in southern Scandinavia, southern Norway and southern Sweden. You can see the yeah, increasing. Uh, yes, yeah, say some words also about the brown bears. It has also increased from very low levels, like 130 individuals in the 30s, to a population size that today is actually more than 200 years ago. So today is about 2,800 brown bears in Sweden. Uh, some bears that we captured with our cameras. Uh, and um, yeah, the research that has been made on this yes, important thing is to, to find out the habitat, uh, different spots and temporal scales that made trends. And one important thing is that they have used uh, uh, samples from uh, hunters and from others that have sent in this so that they can use DNA to, to see how many individuals there are. So in total, there was uh, uh, 3,298, uh, but now it has yeah, decreased somehow. And there is a yearly hunt on the bear population since some time. Uh, and uh, actually, one of my friends from Spain, he said that, uh, he thought that, yeah, it is one of the reasons why brown bear is so accepted, you can imagine 2,800 compared to the so small wolf population, is because they have been allowed to hunt them for, for a long time. And that has uh, led to a, yeah, a positive effect uh, on how, how, uh, yeah, how the hunters uh, uh, yeah, accept the bear. Because the bear also kill a lot of, uh, of moose. Uh, especially during the spring after the hibernation. So they, when they wake up, they are hungry. So then they go out and, and they try to, to get a moose. But you know that they eat about 100,000 blueberries in the autumn for getting fat and my hibernate until April. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, some management of brown bears, uh, so actually the goal was set to uh, 1,000 individuals, but yeah, yeah, they've increased more than that. And um, yeah, I you don't need to read that, but just to mention the reindeer and the Sami, because that's for brown bears, but it's also for the lynx and, um, and to support the wolverine and the golden eagle. The Sami get uh, a supplementation today, the Sami, that have, have the reindeers in the mountain areas and that also migrate down to the boreal forest in the, the wintertime. So they 
get um, supplementation or, or um, subsidized to get a, or a refund or what you can call it uh, if there is uh, um, a new uh, um, pair of uh, lynx just breeding in the territory. So before they need to inspect if they were killed by the, the lynx, for example, but nowadays they get um, payment for this. Uh, yes, um, okay, skip that. Because I want to say something about the wild boar. Uh, Jim said we, we should also say some positive things about the animal. And uh, we have made some studies about wild boar showing some positive effects in Sweden. Here you see the increase that it was so low in uh, Sweden just in the 1990s. And, and if we all know that they have great effects on agriculture, rooting and eating and damaging in the agriculture. But we wanted to study the effects in the boreal forest landscape. Uh, so, yeah, one thing is, of course, that people, how can they grow so fast? Yeah, of course, they have so many young. Uh, here you can see the effects of wild boar rooting in the boreal forest. Uh, in some places, there is hardly any uh, ground left after they have been there. However, we have seen when we have studied the abundance of fungal sporocarps in the boreal forest, where we had compared areas with and without ball, wild boar, that uh, we found a significant difference between areas. Um, so without wild boar, there was a lower amount of fungal sporocarps. And this is mostly um, the saprotrophs, actually. And we also did a study about the predation on we simulated um, um, wader eggs by putting out uh, eggs in the, in the nature. And we saw, you can see that uh, in the control plots and comparing the wild boar plots. So the overall portion of predatedness was higher on the control plots than on the plots with the wild boar. And uh, yeah, this was the experiment. We put out quail eggs, um, one with plaster, and uh, uh, yeah, we also did predative and the damage lost and um, we we designed the egg predators by checking the tooth moss on the plaster eggs and we also have cameras here you can see for example if there has been a bird eating eggs and here uh, marks on the on the eggs from from tooth uh, so we saw that areas with wild boar the most common was red fox and uh, the wild boar. Uh, but um, comparing to the control plots without wild boar versus what we call treatment plots with wild boar, we have a higher predation where there is not wild boar. So we think that uh, there is something related there to wild boar and, and badger that we still have to find out. Uh, so, yeah, the predation was yeah very high in both places. Uh, other, other studies have also shown that. But in our studies, it was that uh, with wild boar, the average was 54% of that, and without wild boar, Seven percent. So um, our study then found that the nest survival rate in this experiment was higher on plots with wild boar, and uh, which we yeah, thought was unexpected as the second main predator in plots of which it was present. So there is some predator interactions between these three players. All uh, two carnivores and one ungulate, and uh, but we still don't know 
how how if the wild boar is uh, or if the badger does, doesn't like the areas where the wild boar are or something like that. Uh, yes, I'm going to say something about the links. I already saw that they have increased to about uh, 1600 in Sweden from also very, very low numbers. There are about uh, one twenty-five percent of the Scandinavian are in, in Norway. They don't accept so much of the the big predators, uh, but uh, yeah, still they have uh, uh, some uh, in Norway. They have a lot of sheep, so so uh, many sheep that are roaming freely in in Norway. Okay, some uh, nice birds in Sweden. We have a lot of uh, owls, old species, and we also have some nice capicalis that are thriving in the forest. Thank you for your attention.